All right. Um, be, uh, before I forget, uh, I'm, I may try to send this to you in an email, but anyway, um, the Michigan Conservative Energy Forum, which is a basically a think tank that tries to use um, basically uh, market-based solutions to getting renewable energy out into the, into the grid. Uh, so they're, they're interested in renewable energy, but using markets to do that. Um, they are looking for, um, uh, they looking for people who uh, want to have a, a fellowship. It's $1,000. Um, for the program, $200 per month from September to January. And basically what you do um, is you're going to do a little bit of research assistance. Uh, and, and it would be, um, obviously, you don't have to go there to do that. Um, but anyway, if you're interested, um, I, I may try to, uh, I don't know exactly how to do it, but I might try to forward this email to you. But anyway, if you're interested in uh, a, it's, they're calling it a fellowship for the fall semester. Um, the thing is that the deadline is August 31st, which is in a few days. Um, so I think, is that Monday? I think that might be Monday. So anyway, uh, if you think you might be interested, why don't you go ahead and send me an email and um, I, will, uh, I will try to get the information to you. Mm -hmm. Did they get any numbers as to the amount of hours you would be working per week or anything like that? Um, yeah, I'll say good, good question. Um, to the, it, it does not say. Um, I don't, I, I'm guessing that it's not a lot of hours. Um, it just says, uh, the, the, I, I, our typical, although it says our typical fellow is a college junior, um, and I think, uh, anyway, what I can do is I can give you the, the information and then perhaps that they've got here. Um, and basically, I want you to do a project. Uh, it says, in the past, projects have included standard white papers, a podcast series on battery technology, uh, a series of op-eds. Um, so in fact, here's what I can do. Why don't I? Here's what I'll do. I'll put a, um, a, a I'll, I'll put and I'll use uh, blackmail to send you an email. It's the only thing I use in Blackboard is the email part of Blackboard. Um, but anyway, I will I will send you the uh, link to their uh, to their website and and the program itself. So that'd be the easiest thing to do. So why don't I just go ahead and uh, Ed Rivet had, had sent this to me and um, so. Sort of a last-minute deal, but I will. Uh, I'll just. I'll put that uh, and send a general email out with this uh, link to this thing, and you can take a look at it. And if you're interested, then you can uh, go ahead and apply. But like I said, the deadline is uh, is the uh, Monday, the 31st. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take roll. Um, so uh, Joel Austin. Uh, Caroline Beal. Here. Uh, Paul Brophy. Here. Uh, Andrew. Here. For the B? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Emma Burback. Here. Uh, Joshua Burnett. Uh, Brendan Bush. Here. Um, Christopher Butters. Here. Uh, Leo, is it Biker? Yeah. Mike Kirk, um, Ian Calvert, uh, Elizabeth Dixon, Claire Gautier. Is that the way you say it? Okay. Um, Audrey Guess, uh, Benjamin Hansen, uh, Daniel Har Harmon, Daniel Harmon. Okay. See what will happen. Did I tell you what's going to happen as you get older? You, you, it's going to be harder to see things, um, but I learned that if you start using reading glasses right away, then your eye gets lazy, and so you try to avoid doing it as long as possible. Did I ever tell you that? So anyway, so sometimes I have to sort of do that because I'm trying. To, I do use reading glasses when I really have to, but um, but one thing that you can do is 
if you can't see something, you can make a little hole like this with your finger and look through it like that. And guess what? You can see better. I mean, you might think, how can that be? But it is. If you go like this, you can, you can see better. And it's because it cuts out the ambient light. And so if you're ever in a, in a, in a place where you can't really read something, you can just try that. So anyway, uh, Patton Harmon, uh, Peter Harrigan, uh, Clara Herzell, Hensel, Hensel. see? <laughs> Ours looks uh, like ends when you're looking. Okay, uh, Nagy, is it Ronich? Haronsek. Okay, uh, I'll just call you Maggie here. Uh, <laughs> Joshua, Joshua Hypes. Okay, uh, Justin Johnson, uh, Jack Ketchum, uh, Meredith Cottom, uh, Thomas McGinnis, uh, Cecilia Moran, uh, Sabrina Nardon. What is it? Nardon. Nardon, okay. Uh, Gabriel Powell. Um, let's see, Laura dropped. Benjamin Raffin. Uh, Laura, is it Rain? Ryan, Laura Ryan. Um, Jack Robinson. Uh, Caleb Sampson. Uh, Mark Sherman. Uh, Edward Skees. Andrew Verbrug. Something like that. Okay, Verbruggy. Um, Maggie Wacken. Wackenhut, is that right, Maggie? Okay. Uh, okay, uh, Dana Weidinger and uh, Jonathan Welker. Here. All right. Um, every Friday, I do a classic album of the week. Okay, um, because our uh, K twelve school system is terrible at history of rock and roll, okay? Um, and so, uh, you know, I want, you know, I, some of you were there and Professor Arn introduces me, right? Um, so uh, this one is Bob Dylan and the band, okay? This is a live concert, 1974. Um, you've probably all heard of Bob Dylan, won the Nobel Prize in literature. Um, but uh, how many have heard of the band? Well, if you, this is incredible. Okay, the band is, you, you, you really have to go, and there's a documentary called The Last Waltz, all right? So I know you're all technologically savvy and you can look this up. Uh, you need to watch The Last Waltz because it is the band's last tour. Um, and what happened was when Dylan went from folk to rock and roll, um, the band in, the, in, his, uh, um, in, in that album, Highway 61 Revisited, uh, the band was the band that played behind him. And then they, they became their own, uh, they were the band. And so this was a, a tour uh, where uh, Dylan uh, played 1974 live concert with the band. Um, and uh, all these lights here are not people holding up cell phones, but holding up matches, right? So when you went to a concert at night outdoors, um, or even indoors, um, some people, you know, you might hold up uh, a, a, a match and, and light. So anyway, uh, that's, that's what that is. So take a look at uh, uh, 1974, it's just called Bob Dylan slash the band. Uh, it's a, a great album. I know you guys know how to get on Spotify or Pandora or whatever, uh, and, and take a listen to that. All right. So, um, last time we talked a little bit about uh, the buffalo, uh, and we were talking about uh, th that, and so I actually have a uh, little article uh, from uh, 2000, um, and it says, um, in truth, it was private conservationists, conservationists who saved the American bison from extic extinction. Bison were initially saved by six individuals who either saw business opportunities in the existence of bison or simply wanted to save a vanishing species, uh, wrote uh, this guy who was a University of Calgary ecologist and uh, wrote a book called The Buffalo Nation. 
uh, History and Legend of North American Bison in 1996. So of the approximately 250,000 bison in North America today, um, the, the, uh, at least 90% of today's bison are in privately owned herds. Um, so just, uh, uh, you know, we're saying that um, if you, you, you know, people respond to incentives, if you want to save the bison, then you need to make it so that people own them, right? And if we talked about people, you know, owning the manatee or whatever, um, and so that's something to think about. Also, there's a nice little article, it's called An Unlikely Way to Save a Species, Serve It for Dinner. Um, so this guy, uh, Gary Paul Nobbin, um, he compiled a list of endangered plants and animals that were once fairly commonplace in American ki uh, kitchens, but are now threatened, endangered, or essentially extinct in the marketplace. And uh, so what he did was he set up a list uh, and wrote a book called uh, Renewing America's Food Traditions, Saving and Savoring the Continent's Most Endangered uh, foods uh, and so what he did is he uh, uh, has made it so that you want you know nobody thinks that uh, we're not going to have potatoes anymore um, even though even if there were a potato famine right somebody's going to figure out a way to deal with that right and so uh, the idea is that if you can get people to want to eat them then other people will will grow them so just uh, make the point um, that uh, uh, you know People respond to incentives and, and things might not be what they seem. So one of the things that we wanted to learn to do here is to think like an economist, right? And um, let's think about that for a moment. Um, Nine million people woke up in New York City today and there was exactly the right amount of Starbucks coffee. There was exactly the right amount of peanuts. There was exactly the right amount of toilet paper. You didn't turn on the news, even though it's COVID, right? You didn't turn on the news and it says, ah, toilet paper shortage in New York, right? So that would be pretty amazing, right? Every day we should just wake up and go, oh my gosh, this is totally incredible. Everywhere in America, right, there's exactly the right amount of stuff. There's not shortages, there's not excess of it. And, and so why is that? Right? I mean, that's one of the things we're going to learn about. Why does that happen? Why is it that we don't have shortages? And when we do have shortages, can we explain why that shortage is going on? Why is that shortage happening? And normally, if there is a shortage, it's because the government is not letting the market system work. Okay? And so we need to, we, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to to learn the market system and see why that is. But really it ought to be pretty amazing that you very seldom see that there's shortage of anything. Go to Venezuela and guess what? You better bring your own toilet paper. Really, you ought to bring your own toilet paper because there's a shortage of toilet paper and shortages of all sorts of stuff in Venezuela, yeah. Good question, uh, and we'll go into this more, but guess what? Almost every state has what? A, what's called a price gouging law, okay? So I can't raise the price of toilet paper, right? I can't raise it above a certain amount. So we'll, we'll go through this, and when we look at demand and supply and equilibrium and stuff, and what we'll do is we'll find out that whenever you see a shortage, it's because almost always, there, there's a time lag, right? Uh, one of the things that they were worried about in the, uh, this recent hurricane that just happened, going through the Gulf, was it gonna wipe out the oil refineries, right? So if all of a sudden the oil refineries get wiped out, right, there may take time for things to adjust a little bit. But well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna learn about how is it that almost all the time you're gonna see you don't see lots of excess of stuff, and you don't see lots of, uh, you know, uh, lots of shortages of things. Uh, and, and the reason is because um, we're going we're gonna to see that the price system is what turns out to allocate resources in, in the market. Um, 
Also, let's think a little bit about um, Sherlock Holmes and Watson in the original Sherlock Holmes story called A Scandal in Bohemia. Um, one of the things that happens is that um, uh, Watson's walking along and he sees Sherlock up in his uh, room, up in this little apartment building, sees him through the window, and he decides he's going to go up and talk to him. Right? So he says, eh, Sherlock's in, I'm going to say hi. He walks up the stairs, knocks on the door, Sherlock has him come in, they're talking for a while, and then uh, Sherlock says to Watson, Watson, how many steps are there coming up from the ground floor? And Watson goes, well, I don't know. And Sherlock says, well, Watson, how many times have you walked up, the, you know, up and down these steps? In fact, um, he says, well, some hundreds of times. And he says, Watson, there are 17 steps coming up the ground floor. The problem with you, Watson, is you see, but you don't observe, okay? One of the things you're going to get out of this class is you're going to observe, right? You're going to see things, and now you're going to observe. And, and most people, well, as Sherlock is telling Watson, lots of times people see something, but they don't observe what's going to happen. And so you end up with legislation. You end up with all sorts of things that people are, uh, you know, they're in favor of because they see, but they don't, but, but they don't observe. And we'll, we'll talk about uh, that in much more detail uh, later on. So, well, the, the, the way that we organize ourselves is through what economists call uh, a market, right? And, but a market isn't like a store or something. That's not what we mean by markets. So, if, we, if we're going to try to look at a market, what are some of the things that, uh, that when we describe markets, what are some characteristics of, of a market? Um, and the first thing is, if you think about it, markets are based on voluntary exchange. Right? You go to the Walmart, when you walk into the Walmart, they don't start throwing stuff into your cart, right? And then you get to the checkout line and they make you buy it. Right? That isn't the way it works. Anytime you're in the Walmart, you put something in your cart, you put it there. Right? And you don't get to throw all sorts of stuff in the cart. You get to the checkout line and you say to Mr. Walmart, okay, I'm going to give you five bucks for the whole thing. It's not the way it works. Right? What happens is Mr. Walmart tells you, here's how much I want for that box of Cheerios. Right? And I want $2.10 for this box of Cheerios. And you decide, oh, okay, I think I'm better off with that box of Cheerios than the $2.10, so you put it in your cart, right? Notice also that everybody that's standing behind the counter is there because they think they're better off than not being there, right? I know, I don't know if you, you know, how many of you are from Hillsdale. I know there's a few of you from Hillsdale. Um, but we don't have trucks that go around and pick people up and drag them out to the Walmart and then chain them behind the checkout counter so that when you walk up there, there's somebody chained behind there and they're having to check you out. That's not how it works. Okay? Anybody that's standing behind the checkout counter is there because they said, oh, Mr. Walmart, and Mr. Walmart says, I'm going to pay you $9.50 an hour to stand behind the checkout counter. You say, oh, I'm good with that, right? So Mr. Walmart is saying, I'm happy with you being there for $9.50. And you say, I'm happy to be there for the $9.50. Otherwise, I'd be doing something else, right? And we're going to talk about later on what's called opportunity cost. We're going to talk about that later on. But the point is, is that everything's a system of voluntary exchange. When you walk out of the Walmart, everybody that walks out of that Walmart is happier than when they went in. Right? You, you don't walk out of the Walmart and say, oh my gosh, I can't believe I spent $250 and I didn't want any of this stuff. Right? If, if you walked out with something, you must have been happier to give them the money than when you, th th then uh, happier to give them the money and take the stuff than keep the money, right? 
That's why the symbol of Walmart is a happy face, right? Because everybody that walks out of the Walmart has to be happier than when they went in. So, it's a joke, um, but it's true. Um, but anyway, the, the point is, is that in a market system, everything that happens in a market system is not forced upon somebody, right? Now, it may be that you have government gets in and forces people to do things, but in a market system, the, the, the point of a market system is not to have that happen. The point of a market system is, there's a, is a system of voluntary exchange. I can't force you to buy my product. You can't force me uh, to, uh, uh, to, buy, to, to buy something. Um, I can't force you to buy my labor, right? I can't, you know, I can't force you to work for me. So everything's a voluntary exchange, yeah. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, we hear a lot about like the quote unquote free market. Uh, is the word free a necessary qualifier? Um, or is all that presupposed in, in market? Yeah, the, the question is, uh, what do we mean by free markets? And that, you're right. Um, but our presumption here is when we're talking about a market in here, we're talking about this condition where you, it is a system of voluntary exchange. And so um, a, a, a free market, we, we, you know, we can add that as an adjective, but generally if we're talking about markets in here, that's what we're talking about. Okay. Second thing that, is a, uh, uh, that we might wanna think about is markets have, are a system of cooperation. So all sorts of cooperation going on in markets. Let's think about that for a minute. Um, how many in here either killed or grew anything that they ate in the last 24 hours? What'd you have? A tomato. Okay. How many in here right now are wearing anything other than a face mask that they made themselves. Okay, now think of what we would look like if we were all just wearing what we made. Okay, now, now you can stop thinking about that. Um, how many in here live in, uh, when they're home, uh, they live in a house or apartment or anything that they built themselves? Not with a general contractor, but actually. So there you have it. Food, clothing, shelter. We didn't make any of it, did we? Right? Food, clothing, shelter. Somebody made all of it for us. <laughs> okay? That's pretty amazing, right? If this were 800 AD, or if this were uh, out in the middle of the Domin Dominican Republic of Congo, in fact, um, not so two summers ago, not this summer or the prior summer, but the summer before that, um, a friend of ours uh, uh, won a, in a, in a raffle, uh, won a hunting safari for four um, in South Africa. Okay? And they uh, called us and you know, asked my wife and I if we wanted to go uh, on this hunting safari in South Africa. It was a week long safari. Uh, and uh, we said, yeah, um, and we ended up going. Um, and then we spent another week touring around South Africa. And one of the things that we did um, was uh, we went to a village um, where, guess what? They make everything themselves, right? Everything. They grow their own food. They, they, they were wearing clothing that, um, that they had, had been donated, uh, you know, because they're, you know, wearing some T-shirt from... Syracuse or something, um, uh, but uh, like I, you know, where we, they, the guy gave it, was giving us a little tour and I went into the, uh, they have a, a mud hut that they make um, and then we went in and um, the floor is shiny um, and uh, I was going, wow, you know, why is that so shiny? He said, well, we use cow dung and, it, and when it dries, it, it, it's shiny like that. So. People are still living that way, right? 
Uh, and if you were producing all your own food, all your own clothing, and all your own shelter, guess what? You're going to be really poor, right? If, somebody, if somebody's living someplace where they're doing all of that, you know that they're poor. So uh, markets result in a situation where what do you do? You, give a, you do accounting practices, right? And then you get paid and somebody else is, is uh, you know, a farmer out there, a dairy farmer that's, you know, making the milk. Um, and then somebody else is growing the corn uh, and somebody else is growing soybeans. Um, and if you live in Hillsdale, which you are nine months out of the year, okay, what crops do you rotate? Rotate corn and soybeans, right? You guys should know this stuff, okay? I mean, you live here. You, 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 you grow corn one season, and then the next year you grow soybeans, right? So, so somebody's out there growing the corn for you. Somebody's making the electricity for you. Uh, somebody built the apartment that you're living in. Um, so you do the one thing, and maybe you're a contractor, or maybe you're a farmer, or whatever. So what does a market do? A market, this market system is just amazing, and there's a total amount of coordination going on that we normally don't observe, right? Talking about seeing and observing. Just observe that all this stuff, look at how little that you do in your daily life that you actually are producing yourself. And so what happens? You tend to specialize in, in, in labor. And, and I, we'll talk a little bit about in the future about um, uh, Adam Smith and his Wealth of Nations. But one of the things that he talks about is specialization of labor. That, that's an important part of uh, of why, uh, you know, why his, his book is called The Wealth of Nations. He's talking about why some, some places are really wealthy and some places aren't. And the more specialization that you have, the more uh, wealthy that you are. A third thing that you might think about is in a market system is there's a lot of coordination. Right? There's a lot of coordination that goes on. Let's just think about this little thing. How many in here first learned to write using a pencil? OK. All right. So uh, now I am uh, uh, President Trump. Uh, and I'm going, oh my gosh. Pencils are vitally important to the education of America, and they're too important to be left to the market process. So we're going to have a, within the Department of Education, um, we're going to have a Department of Pencils uh, to make sure that pencils get delivered here. So uh, I'm going to be interviewing you uh, to see if you can uh, apply for um, the directorship of the uh, um, pencils uh, for, uh, for the Department of Education. So, um, this stuff right here that you write, what is that? It's not lead, is it? What is it? Graphite. Yeah, it's graphite, okay? Where do you get graphite? You mine it, right? So, what is one of the largest producers of graphite where you'd get graphite? That would be Sri Lanka, okay? Um, now, uh, if you think about it for a little bit, if you just had graphite here, it would all crumble, so you mix it with clay. And there's a special type of mud that is the clay. And the largest producer in the United States of mud for pencils is the state of Mississippi. Okay. Um, now, uh, again, if you sort of look at the, the graphite mixture here, it's, it's a little bit shiny, right? Um, and that's because in here is candia wax, and where you would get candia wax would be, it's C-A-N-D-I-L-L-A, -L -L -A, but pronounced candia, Mexico, all right? All right, so now the wood, the wood is a soft wood, um, and it could come from uh, the Pacific Northwest, or it might come from Georgia. Um, but the, the lacquer in the, the paint sort of on here is made of a lacquer. And if we think about how, what do you make lacquer with? 
make lacquer out of castor beans. Um, and the uh, world's largest producer of castor beans, you're most likely to get castor beans, is India. OK. Um, guys aren't doing too well on this. Um, OK. Um, this is called the ferrule, and it's made out of brass, right? And uh, brass is made out of zinc. And the largest producer of zinc, the more you're likely to get the zinc is Peru, OK? Um, and it's also made out of copper. Now, you can get copper in Michigan, right, if you're from the UP, eh? Anybody from the UP? Oh, OK. If you're from the UP, this is how you talk, eh? Um, anybody from Canada? OK, and how do you spell Canada? C-A-N-A-D-A. -A -A. So anyway. Um, the, uh, so this part is the eraser, right? And it's made out of rubber, um, and, uh, or it could be synthetic, uh, which would be uh, styrene and butycene. Um, but if it's rubber, it's probably from either Malaysia or Brazil, OK? But the, the uh, uh, rubber isn't what do, it really does the erasing, right? Um, the erasing is uh, actually done, uh, they're embedded in the rubber as fractice. And that's made from rapeseed oil. And uh, where would you get rapeseed oil? That would be Indonesia. Okay? So, guys didn't do too well on this. Um, but what do we notice about this? We notice that this pencil came from all over the world, right? Parts of this pencil are coming from all over the world. Now you, as the minister of pencils, right? You gotta figure out how you're gonna get all this stuff, and, and you don't wanna have enough, uh, you know, uh, rapeseed oil for 100,000 pencils and enough zinc for 50,000 pencils, right? You wanna have, to, to match it up, you gotta get this stuff from all over the world, and then you gotta decide where am I going to produce the pencils? And how many factories am I going to produce them in? Right? Am I going to have the factories right next to the port because I'm bringing in a lot of stuff from around the world? Or would I put the factories near uh, major cities because that's where uh, you know, a lot of my sales will go? Okay? So you've got to figure out where you're going to put all this stuff. Um, and I want to have exactly, just as we were talking about New York, I want to have exactly the right amount of pencils at every retail establishment in America at every minute in time, right? I don't want it to be, you know, if we have a normal non-COVID year, right? Um, I don't want it to be that it becomes the uh, first part of August and people are going in and buying pencils for their kids to school that there's, you know, only a few boxes of pencils in that store or, you know, the Walgreens uh, in Menominee doesn't have pencils, right? And I don't want to have thousands of boxes of pencils sitting, you know, at the mire uh, in Grand Rapids, right? I want to have the right amount of pencils, I want, to, I want to be able to walk into a store somewhere, any retail establishment that sells pencils, I want to, there to be pencils there. And I don't want there to be lots and lots of pencils. Okay. Uh, and now think about this. How cheaply do I want this to happen? Right? I want you to bring this stuff from all over the world. I want you to get it all produced together. I want you to move it from the factory. I want to move all the stuff to the factory. I want to move the stuff from the factories to the retail outlets. And how much does a pencil cost? We don't know. Why? Because they're like manna. They just show up, <laughs> right? You probably all got a pencil, but you probably didn't buy that pencil, did you? Right? It's got, you know, Hillsdale Academy or something on the side, right? I got lots of pencils, but I can't remember how, when the last time I bought a pencil was, right? That's how cheap they are. Now think, could you possibly do that, right? Could you possibly do that? Now the question is, what makes you think you could do it for healthcare, right? <laughs> right? 
You wouldn't trust your government to get pencils there, right? But you might trust your government to get healthcare there. And think about how well that's, how well that's, that, that's going to work out. So what are we going to learn? We're going to learn in this class how this works. How is it, how is it that magically this pencil gets here? And again, um, the, the, there's a, a, a little article that was written in, the, in 1954 by uh, Leonard Reed uh, called I Pencil. Um, and uh, it's uh, in the Wolfram folder um, in the Ecom 105 section. I think I'm, I might have it posted there. But uh, there's a, it was produced in Imprimus. And it, how many have ever heard of Imprimus? Right, all right, okay. Well, one of the earlier uh, issues of Imprimus, they republished uh, uh, Reed's uh, uh, iPencil, and, uh, and it's, it, it's pretty famous. All right. Um, now, let's think about some of the, uh, uh, when we go to analyze uh, how this market system works, some of the uh, assumptions that we might want to make. Right? Because we're going to develop a theory of how markets work. And uh, you know, if you've had any, uh, any kind of uh, you know, science class or whatever, right? and you develop, you're going to develop a theory about um, how electrons move about or something, right? you've got to make some assumptions to start with. And so um, one of the uh, primary assumptions that we make, if we sort of think about what sort of assumptions are we make about describing how this market process works. Because it, when you're walking around every day, guess what? You're in this system, right? You probably bought something in the last 48 hours. Right? You might have bought a face mask. You might have you know, bought, a, bought a pencil. <laughs> probably not. Somebody gave you a pencil. Um, but uh, so, so you're, you know, every day, you, you're going to go out into the market and sell your labor, right? You're going to decide, are you going to go to law school? Are you going to go to med school? Are you going to go to work? And, you know, are you going to uh, go to work for American Electric Power? Or what, what are you going to do, right? So you're going to be participating in this market process. So, one of the first things that we think about is that we're going to look at the individual. Right? It's the individual that we're talking about. We're not talking about um, what do women do, or uh, what do left-handed people do, or what do children do. Right? We're talking about individuals. What does that, well, we're going to analyze, we're going to look at individual behavior. Okay? How pencils get here, how this chalk got here, um, we're, when we analyze that system about how it works, our focus is on individuals. How do, how do individuals work? Okay? Um, the, the, and so what do we assume about that? We assume that they're rational. Right? And what do we mean by rational? What we mean by rational is you act to make yourself better off. Right? You're, you act, you're rational and you act to make yourself better off. Now, what does that mean? That means that you're what we call self-interested. Right? So we often say, if you're an you know, economist, we often say that people are rational, self-interested individuals. Right? And self-interest is, okay, I'm going to do things that try to make me better off, and I'm not going to do things that are irrational in the sense that I'm just going to walk up today and I'm going to say, you know what, I think uh, I'm going to uh, poison myself, right? Or I think I'm going to chop my hand off, okay? Um, you're doing things to make yourself better off. If you are, now, it may be that you are not rational because you have some condition, um, you have some sort of mental condition that makes it so that you're not rational. And so you do find that people commit suicide, for example, right? You find, but what we're assuming is that for most people, right? I mean, we don't have to get it right for everybody, but for most people, our assumption that when you act, you 
are deciding to make yourself better off and you act in a way to make yourself better off. Yes? Do modern markets truly assume the rationality of human beings? Because like, wasn't there a major shift in, shift in advertising in the late 50s and early 60s that kind of moved to more emotional aspects of promoting products like the cigarette companies you mentioned in the first lecture? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that it is, you, the, the question was, it is, you know, are, are we more, um, um, do we act emotionally and, and not rationally? What all we're doing is we're saying, however you decide that you're going to make yourself better off, whether it's just going to make you feel better, and that's what we're really talking about, right? I may decide to, uh, in fact, I, uh, you know, my wife and I give money away to different charities, okay? Um, and why do we do that? Because we feel better about having done that. And there, the, there is a, you know, there is a question of are people not rational, right? Think about if people weren't rational, then how could you develop a theory, right? The theory would have to be that if people act randomly, right, suppose they're not rational, Okay, what are they going to do? We could have, they could act randomly. And then what would we have to do? We'd have to develop some sort of probability model, right? If you've ever, how many have ever um, had uh, a, uh, a science where they talk about electrons moving around? Okay, well, what do you learn? You learn that, um, that, that you don't really know where any particular electron is, right? But you know there's some probability that it's within a certain uh, uh, orbit, right? An elect and so what are you trying to do? You're trying to figure out what's the probability that these electrons are where they are, right? So you could develop a system like that. There's a whole, uh, 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 Vernon Smith won the Nobel Prize a number of years ago for developing uh, what's called behavioral economics. Um, which looks at it and we find out that um, people, uh, people sometimes have uh, um, risk aversion um, where, uh, well, uh, let's put it this way. One of the things they find out is that you tend to, th to, to think things are more likely to occur if what happens is you see a lot of news about this particular thing or if it's a major event, right? You think that the probability of a category four hurricane hitting is higher than it really is because when you hear about category four hurricanes, they talk about it like crazy, okay? What if there were a virus um, that you heard lots and lots and lots about, okay? And you think then the probability of this thing happening is really high, or at least higher than what the, the data would show, right? So that could happen. So um, we, uh, the, uh, really about 30 years ago, um, there's this uh, behavioral economics developed um, and um, I believe Professor Clark may, he, he, he maybe includes it in some of his classes or um, he uh, may have a uh, 393 class on behavioral economics. But anyway, um, in behavioral economics you try and say, okay, um, people don't, don't know exactly what's going on, but we're still, what you're still assuming is, given what they think is going to happen, they do it in a way that they think is going to make themselves better off. Whether they're doing it through emotion, or whether they just don't have the understanding, or whether they just make a mistake, right? Somebody says, hey, you want to go on a blind date with uh, so-and-so, right? You want to go on a blind date with, with uh, this friend of mine, Claire. And you go, yeah, that, that okay, I'm willing to do that. Um, and then about 20 minutes into the date, you're going, oh my gosh, I've made myself worse off, right? 
Uh, I thought I was making myself better off when I decided that I was going to go on this blind date, but I've clearly made myself worse off. Right? Um, so you're going to get, get it. It's not going to say that you're always going to get it right. You're going to make mistakes. And when we read Hayek's Constitution of Liberty, which we're going to, one of the things that we, he's going to talk about is you need to be free to go out and experiment in things and to try things because you may not know what's best for you. You are going to try to make yourself better off. And sometimes you're going to get it wrong just because you made a mistake. Sometimes you're going to get it wrong because you really didn't know what the probabilities were. Sometimes you're going to get it wrong because you, you are uh, doing things emotionally rather than thinking through rationally. But even if you're doing it emotionally, why you're doing it is because that you think you're going to make yourself better off by doing that. Right? Whether you've thought through it or whether you're just doing it emotionally. And if we can figure out what your emotions are, see, what are we trying to do? We're trying to predict behavior, right? And if I find out that you guys do things emotionally, what am I going to do? I'm going to change the way I advertise, right? I'm going to change the way I advertise because I, now I know that you guys are going to do things based on emotion. And so what am I going to do if I'm a politician running for office? Okay? If I'm a politician running for office, and I figure out that you guys do things emotionally rather than reasoning out by having taken Ecom 105 and understanding that if you do this, it's going to cause this to happen, right? Then I'm going to have advertising that's based on emotion, right? And all I got to do is watch the advertising as we run into this election in November, right? Lots of it's going to be emotional, right? And that's because, again, when you t if you take Econ 415, and um, we talk a little bit about it in here, we might say that people are going to say that people are what's called rationally ignorant. That is, there's a cost to you of learning about things, right? And if the benefit to you of learning about it is less than the cost of learning about something, you're not going to learn about it, right? If I, you know, uh, will I... Uh, there's a, some cost to knowing what's every ingredient in the power bar, right? But if I think the added benefit to me of knowing about that is less than the added cost to me of looking it all up on, you know, Google search or something, um, then I'm not going to do it, right? So it's called rationally ignorant. All right. Um, and so uh, if you take um, Mises's, uh, or if you take uh, Professor either uh, Professor Clark or uh, Professor Steele in particular. Um, Professor Steele's uh, class in Austrian economics, uh, what he talks about, and we'll read his Ludwig von Mises, one of the required uh, books in here is Mises' is Liberalism, right? Um, but his uh, magnum opus is called Human Action. It's called human action. Why is that? Because it's a discussion about how that people act to try to make themselves better off, and how does that what what system is most likely to result in people becoming better off? And you know, if we again, if you just sort of think about a pencil, um, you're going to get the idea that probably a market system is going to work better than a system that's based on central planning. Okay. Um, you're probably going to be better off in Canada than you are in Venezuela. Right? You're probably going to be better off in the United Kingdom than you are going to be in North Korea. You're probably better off in South Korea than North Korea. Okay? And so, uh, you know, what, what the point here is that we're trying to, to, uh, to develop a theory about how people act, and then we can see what sort of, we're, one of the things we're going to look at is what political system is consistent with this market system, right? And so that's when we're going to start looking at uh, Best Shots of the Law, Mises' Liberalism, and Hayek's Constitution of Liberty, et cetera, to start looking at, once we understand how markets work, uh, then we will uh, be able to, uh, to, to move on with that. All right. Um, what we're going to do, we're, we're almost to the, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, does the 
the last piece of this is does the state exist for the individual or does the individual exist for the state? That is, we form a government, right? And what should the government look like? Why did we form that government, right? Are we there for the government or did we form the government to, to do that? Uh, and so uh, we'll finish that with just a little piece. And then we're going to look at demand. So again, I don't require you to read such and such by a certain time, right? You're going to, when we get to the midterm, um, you've, you know, if you, again, if you look in the Wolfram Econ 105 folder, lots and lots of old midterms are there. So you're going to study for those. So as long as you've prepared yourself for the exam, you're good. I don't say read this by a certain date. But uh, we will be doing, when we get around on Monday, we're going to be looking at, uh, we're going to be looking at demand. So you might want to go ahead and, and uh, look at that. Or if you have access to a uh, uh, Principles of Microeconomics book that, how many have had friends that have taken Principles of Micro? Whatever. Okay, so if you, if you have, anyway, if you have, you might want to grab yourself a microeconomics textbook if you like, want to look at more detail. One thing is, I may not be in office hours this afternoon from 1 to 2. Uh, I will be in later in the day. I might be in there, uh, but probably not till at least 2 o'clock, okay? So uh, if you're thinking about coming in today, I got uh, a meeting that got called, and I probably won't be there till at least 2 o'clock, all right?